Hi, my name's Bob Grinier, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So, welcome to How to Reliably Make Strange Radiation. So recently I came across this paper, and I found that it was in Russian, and I found that it had a beautiful image of a mushroom segment strange radiation track here. And I actually included this on the title slide of my disruptive presentation that was talking about how you could potentially initiate the production of strange radiation. Anyway, so this is where it came from and I have translated it over the last few days and I really, really want to share this with you because it is so exciting and it hopefully will allow your minds to come to terms with what potentially is going on and how important this type of radiation is and how ubiquitous it is and that it may be fundamental to living organisms and also to the process of transmutation and ball lightning. So without further ado, I'm going to basically read most of it and then I'm going to branch out to other examples. The document has links to the original Russian in here and there are other text and images that have a link attached to them with a red box and when you download this PDF, you will be able to explore those and start to appreciate that this really is what is going on in Lena and it is continuous source of amazement for me about how far ahead the Russian researchers are in investigating this. And it's not necessarily only independent researchers. This is at the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology and the Moscow Energy Institute Technical University. These are not small institutes now, whilst it appears, at least at the public level, that in the West, for decades, people researching the field of low energy nuclear reactions have been largely ignored, at best, and sometimes ridiculed and derided, it is a completely different circumstance in Russia. And I hope that the videos that I'm sharing and the other material that's going to come to light in the coming weeks and months will be a real wake-up call for those scientists around the world who have not been paying attention to what has been going on and the significance of it. Anyway, let's get into it. Experiments are described to study the interaction of low-power laser radiation of the visible range with water which was previously in a strong heterogeneous magnetic field and exposed to scattered sunlight for several days. By irradiating magnetized water with a laser, the water becomes a source of unusual radiation, the characteristics of which differ dramatically from those of radiation, fields and particles known to date. Introduction. In reference one, it was reported about the discovery of a new type of solar radiation and the possible association of this radiation with processes in biological systems. So this is coming from a group that is using technology to try and find out what this radiation type is and how it plays a role in biology. And so they actually used a type of magnet that is often used in biological and chemical research, and I'll come on to that a little bit later. Further work on the optical properties of this type of radiation and its interaction with various substances has become independent and is ongoing. Fundamentally, new properties of this type of radiation have been established which differ from the properties of classical optical radiation. The works of Leonid Oroitskov and his co-workers turned out to be important for us, in which the electrical explosion of conductors in the form of a foil in water was investigated, and the appearance of plasma formations was observed. When analysing the emission spectra of these formations, atoms were found that were not originally in the foil and water, and traces of radiation were recorded on photographic materials which were called strange, since the authors of that paper could not identify it as a radiation known to science. Soon after the article appeared in 2002, V. Skvortsov 
and N. Vogel published a paper which referred to the registration of radiation very similar to that received in experiments by Aroitzkev et al. The conditions of the experiment differed significantly from those of the experiments in the aforementioned work. The works described above caught our attention because they could be related to the radiation we discovered during our experiments with the sun in 2001. Now this paper is actually from uh, 2012. We have described in detail the methodology and results of experiments with a new type of solar radiation in a number of publications, 145. The new radiation has differences that make it possible to separate it from known radiation, primarily by the presence of a rest mass for the quanta of the new radiation. The rest mass spectrum is in the range from 2.9 to 3.9 electron volts. That is to say, this is the kind of energy that's contained within it when this particle of quanta of material is not actually moving anywhere. It hasn't got any kinetic energy. The presence of resting mass of quanta of a new type of radiation makes it possible to predict the presence of a magnetic moment for them and the possibility of interaction between them. Realization of these possibilities made it possible to proceed to conduct experiments in a magnetic field. The presence of rest mass in particles means that their speed can be changed, including reduced up to a complete stop. So they're saying because it has rest mass, it will have a potentially a magnetic moment and this will allow them to capture the radiation. Experimental technique and results. We knew from our experiments with new type of radiation from the sun that many media are capable of absorbing quanta of new radiation and therefore stopping it, i.e. slowing it down until it stops. We chose water for our first experiments. To ensure the polarization of the magnetic moments of quanta at a water temperature of 300 degrees Kelvin, a magnetic field with induction B satisfying the condition mu B K T is required. Here, mu is the magnetic moment of the quantum, K is the Boltzmann's constant, T is the temperature of the water and dissolved accumulated new quanta in it. When we started the experiment, we did not have information about the magnitude of the magnetic moment of the new quantum, but from the qualitative estimates, we hope to meet the condition given above when using strong magnetic fields. Later it turned out that for polarization, it is enough to create a field, the induction value of which is close to 0.5 Tesla. Our second assumption in preparing the experiments was that new quanta polarized by the magnetic field would be drawn into the maximum magnetic field area and compressed by that field to a state where they would interact with each other in a phase transition condensation of the new quanta into micro drops, i.e. they're having these quanta of radiation cohering and condensing into a condensate. And subsequent external exposure would allow them to be extracted from the water. Water in a 0.1 liter glass dish was kept in a 0.5 Tesla magnetic field for 10 to 15 days under conditions of access to scattered radiation of the sun. After exposure, the dish with the water was extracted from the magnetic field and irradiated with a laser with a wavelength of 633 nanometers or 644 nanometers. So these are just two lasers in the visible spectrum. The laser power did not exceed 1.5 milliwatts. On the path of the laser beam, there was a film in a cassette, which was wrapped in aluminium foil for additional light isolation. The irradiation time varied from 10 to 25 minutes. After irradiation, the film was processed in a standard way. An isopanchrome aerial film with a sensitivity of 1000 units was used as a photodetector. 
Gaston a resolution of at least 110 millimeters. At the same time, we were guided by the registration methods where wide X-ray film was used. But we decided to use 35 millimeter wide roll film because of the simplicity of operations with it. Okay, so I'm just going to look at the various components. Now, I tried to identify these things as best as possible. So we have water in a dish. I imagine it will be covered so that you stop evaporation because it's going to be exposed to the sun for some time. So it will be in a sealed dish. You have some strong magnets and you have uh, sunlight. Uh, then uh, they used a laser and some roll film, 35 millimeter roll film, and that released the uh, quanta of radiation. So I have down there water in a 0.5 Tesla field exposed to sun equals elixir vitae. So what have we got here? Right, so if you look at neodymium magnets, uh, if we want something that is 0.5 Tesla, well, neodymium magnets N35 is 12.5 thousand gauss, uh, up to N52s, which are 14.4 kilogauss. So what does that convert to? Well, 14.4 uh, kilogauss is actually 1.44 Tesla. So actually, we only need 5,000 gauss to give us the 0.5 Tesla. So these are the kind of units in biological research that they may have used. The magnetic field from these neodymium magnets increases transduction in experiments. And so this is available from Merck. But unfortunately, this is about typically around about 600 pounds uh, for a 96 magnet uh, well. And uh, I then looked for and I don't actually know the field strength of this. So and I, it's not very readily uh, obvious. So I looked for available magnets that could be purchased at a reasonable cost. And it turns out that you can get these half by half inch uh, magnets here um, uh, off eBay in the US quite readily. Uh, and a pack of 20 uh, is $34.99. So if you wanted 96 or 100, let's say, you need five times that. So you're, you're talking around about... Uh, I don't know, four times five, two hundred dollars, uh, a little bit more, uh, possibly with delivery. So that's a massive reduction from buying this particular one here. Of course, you have to get some aluminium block or some um, some polymer block and uh, make some wells for you to put your magnets in. But you can see here actually that it's got five point five kilotesla on this uh, meter, and so this would meet the requirement. So for about $200, uh, you could get the magnets required to provide the magnet part of this. And then here is a 5 milliwatt laser for an Arduino, and it's only £1.41, so it's not going to break the bank, and it's more than enough power to do the job. You can get 1 milliwatt lasers. Now, they say that they did not use more than 1.5 milliwatts, and this is red, so it's still in the visible range. So this, this isn't precisely what they used, but it's so cheap that you might as well give it a go. Uh, and here is the sort of film. And uh, as they say, uh, it's much easier to get this film. There are still places you can get it developed. And so uh, for £10, you get a roll of film, and uh, it will provide the job, in my understanding. They don't specify precisely what the film is, so it might be a little bit of a hit and miss, but uh, once you've actually got the magnets, everything else is really rather cheap. Okay, let's move on. The perforated roll film was filled to a standard uh, polystyrene photocassette. Steel photocassettes were also used. The film was reeled tightly enough so that the length of the reel was 1.6 to 1.7 meters and the number of coils in the reel was 35 on average. This method of detection subsequently proved to be quite effective. In the very first experiments on irradiated photographic films, we found traces 6, 7. Subsequently, by varying the experimental conditions, conditions for the complete reproducibility of the results were found. There were no traces on the control films located outside the irradiation zone. There were also no traces on the films that were irradiated with water without exposure to a magnetic field, as well as with exposure to a weak magnetic field. 
As in the experiments, too, the dimensions of the traces on the photographic film varied from 10 micrometers to 10 millimeters. All photographic films were scanned on a flatbed scanner with a high resolution, and individual fragments were examined using an optical microscope and recorded with a digital camera. The optical resolution of the scanner and camera exceeded the resolution of photographic film. Digital image processing made it possible to identify various types of tracks and their geometric dimensions. The simplest traces were objects in the form of dots, which at high magnification had the form of circles or ovals with a diameter of 10 micrometers to 200 to 300 micrometers. Examples of such traces are shown in figure one. We associate these objects with micro droplets of condensate of new quanta, which were discussed above. More complex objects are formed from these simpler objects. The next most complex object is chains consisting of micro droplets. Micro droplets in the chain are arranged in a regular manner, which can be seen in figure two. This indicates that the micro droplets interact with each other. The one dimensionality of the chains means that the micro droplet field has an axial and polar character, which is characteristic of the interaction of magnetic moments. Now I've got a link here and we'll have a look at that. And this is uh, the polymer that was exposed to radiation from the processed fuel. And you'll see that it has this dot chain here in this image. So you'll be able to go and look at that and zoom into it as and when you like. So, very similar structure here. Thus, our assumption of magnetic moment is confirmed by the formation of regular chains. The second important conclusion from the analysis of chains is that micro droplets, or clusters in another terminology, are separated from each other at some distance. This means that each micro drop is at its minimum potential and the overall potential of the chain is periodic. Neither the Coulomb fields of electric charges nor an ordinary magnetic field are capable of creating a stable periodic potential with minima at a distance of 30 to 300 microns. And this is precisely the period of different chains observed in the experiment. Nonlinear self-acting fields known in theoretical physics as Yang-Mills fields have this property. Micro droplets in a chain have a shape that differs from the shape of single micro droplets. This can be easily explained by the interaction between adjacent micro drops, which deform the field of a single micro droplet. Now, it's not very clear in here that that is the case, but it is clear in here where you can see the drops, or uh, as they call them, there's a, they're round, but they're slightly distorted towards each other. In reference to, it was noted that traces on photographic film are always located in the plane of the photographic film, regardless of its orientation relative to the direction of propagation of radiation. The traces on our films have exactly the same properties. The shape of the tracks, including the chains on our films, is identical to those published in 2, 3 and 9. This allows us to believe that we are dealing with the same physical phenomenon. The flatness of the tracks is quite understandable within the framework of our concept. In a magnetically interlocked chain, the field between adjacent microdrops is mostly locked in a small area. External interaction is possible only for micro droplets at the ends of the chain. Therefore, the chain always clings to the film with its end and then lies flat in the plane of the film. Note that if the chain of magnetic moments closes, its interaction with the environment through which the chain spreads weakens. In this case, the closed chain can spread over long distances through any condensed media with little or no interaction. Indeed, our experiments have not found media that could serve as a screen for the radiation in question. The weak interaction of closed chains leads to another effect. 
the traces on the film are randomly arranged. An object that is able to leave a mark on a film can pass through dozens of layers of film without interaction and then leave a mark on only one layer. Judging by the blackening of the trace, including individual micro droplets, it can be assumed that the lightening of the film is due to the complete transition of the rest mass of the micro droplets into the ionization energy of the photosensitive layer. If we focus on the relationship between the energy of the charged particle and the blackening area of the particle trace, the resting mass of the micro droplets is between 1 mega electron volts and 300 mega electron volts. This estimation is quite tentative because micro drops of electric charge do not have any other way to estimate their rest mass. Figure 2 shows two chains with different periods. The left chain contains 27 links with a period of 88 micrometers. The right chain has 45 links with a period of 60 micrometers. So, left, right. Interestingly, the width of the trail in the chains is also different. Since the width of the trace is determined by the size of the micro droplet, i.e. by its mass, as we assumed above, it can be assumed that the relationship between the chain width and its period gives certain indications of the nature of the micro droplet field. In addition to long, regular and almost straight chains, there are many short chains, including curved ones. Examples of such traces are shown in figure 1. In some cases, forks are observed, i.e two traces coming from the same microdrop. The presence of forks means that in some cases the microdrop field is different from that of the dipole. What they are saying is they've got curved ones here, straight ones, but sometimes they've got forked ones like this. You've got a fork there and you've got a fork here and you've got a kind of fork here, which means they're not just dipoles. They can form configurations that are not just dipoles. Objects of a higher degree of complexity can be constructed from chains and individual micro droplets. The complex objects of various configurations found by us on the films are rather large, up to 10 millimeters or more. There are objects of the chain ball type with the shape of spheroids. Examples of such objects are shown in figure 3. So these are what they call chain ball types. Now I have argued that strange radiation can cluster into any of the allotropes of carbon. That be carbon nanotubes, that be graphene, that be uh, buckyballs, uh, that be diamond and buckyballs within buckyballs within buckyballs, and carbon nanotubes within carbon nanotubes within carbon nanotubes, or buckyballs stuck onto buckyballs at different sizes or inside each other, or carbon nanotubes with buckyballs on them, or spheres with, with tubes coming off them, and, and so on. So these are the things that uh, I have seen evidence for uh, that these structures of this radiation can form into. Now, what you're actually seeing when you're looking at uh, the exposed film is the destruction of a structure of this quantized condensed material. And it, it produced a very blurred one here. But I am of the firm belief that what we are seeing uh, in this work, which was observed when we were looking at Roish and Amaza's vibrator plates. Now we already know that it produced the periodic structures. We established it was cavitating within the first few hours of doing tests and within the first day we established that it was producing strange radiation and then later I took these images and they look strikingly similar to images in cold fusion experiments in the early 1990s and published in Fusion Technology by Takaaki Matsumoto. This is in 1993. And this composite image here was produced by Dr. Felix Schulkman. 
And you can see actually also that you have this central structure, but you also have this uh, field around it. Now, it could be that the central structure is this condensate, this chain sort of, it's a little bit more clear on the, the structure by Matsumoto. But uh, th there's this kind of, this might be this kind of non-linear field that they are talking about. And we also captured a similar structure here on uh, webcam. In fact, it was captured on this webcam with some uh, polytetrafluoroethylene PTFE tape over it, uh, with the fluorine potentially being very important to excite the strange radiation as it travels through it. And then it's got exactly the same structure. So you can see here is the famous strange radiation uh, cluster track that you see on the lion outside of the core material. And you can see how it precisely lines up. But this, this was captured on a, on a CCD. Uh, so and it's, it's kind of like taking a segment. This here is like taking a segment of, of this structure. So if you had a fra fragment of this structure touching the CCD, you would end up with it looking a bit like this. And so I think all of these things are uncannily uh, related. And I think what you are seeing here on the Amasa plates are the same thing that was observed by uh, Matsumoto. And I believe it's the same thing, which is a bit just blurry here, uh, where you've got the, the dense bit in the middle and the, the sort of less dense area on the outside. Anyway, moving on. Objects in the form of torus ring consist of closed chains are widespread. For the reasons discussed above, closed chains are not observable. In our experiments, closed torae were not revealed. But in the set, there are half rings that are obtained when the rings are broken and leave a trace on the film. An example of such a semi-ring is shown in figure four. The dimensions of the half rings differ in the experimental conditions and orientation relative to the film plane. Now, he's suggesting that this was a full ring and it basically this is just a bit that kind of snapped off. And so because it's uh, got the ends uh, available, uh, it, it can then attach itself to the film and it just falls apart. It, it has to be said that there is a beautiful image by Takaaki Matsumoto in the early 1990s where he shows a, a torus... Uh, but uh, a segment like this has broken off and it's kind of like broken and then snapped around. In one case, a figure was observed that looked like a spinning top type object. See figure five, so referring to this. This top is very similar to objects observed in experiments three. The signs of rotation of the top are noticeable from the vortex features on the short axis of the top and on the edges of the disc seen from the end face. It is extremely important that the edge of the disc is firmly attached to the hole in the film perforation and gives clear marks on three holes. So they're talking about here, doink, 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 doink. <laughs> the holes seem to tear the disc into separate fragments. The mechanism of interaction of a magnetic object with inhomogeneities in the dielectric constant of a photographic film is apparently due to the generation of an electric field in the frame of reference associated with a photographic film when the magnetic object, dipole, moves relative to the photographic film. An induced electric field polarizes the film. Polarized film interacts with moving clusters. Another example of this interaction is shown in figure six here. Now, these T structures, in my view, are the same as the echo structures, which you can see uh, close up images here, these uh, T structures here, uh, T, T structure here, which we've talked about in a number of presentations. Figure seven shows a fungus shape. These figures are observed quite often the size of the cap is from 3 to 8 millimetres. 8 millimetres! And the thickness is from 1 to 3 millimetres. But the leg of the fungus is sometimes not fixed. Figure 8 shows, with a large magnification, the fine structure of the fungus head in the form of a wave system with a characteristic size of 30 microns and similar to a shockwave trail as recorded in aerodynamic experiments. So this is the image 
which I absolutely love. It's the most beautiful image, and this is the one, the type of one, that's been observed in many different systems. Hydrodynamic generators, the use of cobalt-60 and cesium-137, i.e. gamma emitters. So if you are producing gamma, you will create these things. And uh, Bogdanovich used a, a synchrotron electron beam through conversion targets to convert it into gamma and pass it through a magnetic field. And guess what? He produced these things. So if you are firing gamma into condensed matter, you will produce these things. And this is what is being said uh, by Bogdanovich, is that these things these mushrooms as they call it here it's just funny because it's it's what i i call them <laughs> but anyway um these mushrooms they are able to act as like virtual direct monopoles and in being in that way they can cohere matter and they can transmute matter and in theory if they are big enough they can even rip matter apart i.e. decay protons and so this is the close-up so this area is a zoomed in area of the head here figures 9 to 12 show photographs of the fungus obtained with the quanta 200 scanning electron microscope SEM the images were taken from an emulsion at various magnifications see scales below the image they show that the surface is covered with spherically shaped protrusions with a diameter of about four micrometers. Their number is greater in the center of the cap and less at the edges. So they are greater in the center of the cap and less at the edges. Greater in the center of the cap, less uh, at the edges. And here we go. These are the pits. Now, we have to bear in mind that if you look at the work of Alexander Shishkin who, and his team at Dubna, he worked out uh, from 2008 onwards that this is the explosive unpacking of what he calls a magnetotoro electrical radiation, but in the form of a neutral form, uh, which is the solaton. Uh, of in, he, he considers it to be uh, condensed coal neutrinos. Anyway, that being said, uh, the pits they identified, these are differently assumed than are assumed by these authors. And uh, Shishkin et al. calculated that the material that the string vortex soliton passes through takes on the nature of the atoms to which it's exposed and that the pits that arise are directly proportional in depth and in diameter to the atoms which the string vortex soliton passed through. And it's interesting because Ken Shoulders said that an EVO is actually something akin to an atom without its nucleus. So it's just like a, a, a bunch of electrons that are all effectively coherent. So this, this is... a differently interpreted here and I have got the reference here to this new type of radiation and these micro craters were filmed by SEM also you can see that they're very very clear they're again semi-randomly arranged if you thought this was like a regular magnetic structure then you can see that it's semi-randomly -ran arranged here so it doesn't make any sense and the concept of it explosively unpacking is uh, one that makes more sense and here's all the different methods that you can produce it so you can use corona discharge and and so forth and 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 uh, cavitation and uh, hydrodynamic generators and gamma radiation sources and so forth so these are the different ways that you can produce this type of radiation let us dwell in more detail on the meaning of the term magnetic moment. We have already mentioned that the basis of our interpretation of the experiment is that assumption that quanta of new radiation condenses in a strong magnetic field. As a result of condensation, micro droplets of condensate are formed, a new object in the quantum field. Micro drops of condensate have a mass well above the 5 electron volts value and must contain a significant number of new radiation quanta. 
As a result of condensation of these quanta, their electromagnetic field is converted into a magnetic field of a micro drop, which has a predominantly magnetic dipole configuration. The magnetic field of micro droplets and objects consisting of micro droplets differs from the usual Maxwell magnetic field in that it is carried by massive quanta. Massive quanta are known in physics. They are vector bosons, W plus and minus and Z naught, carrying a weak interaction. A field with massive quanta is non-linear and self-acting, i.e. emits itself. And short range, with a range of the order of the Compton wavelength. All these signs of a massive field are characteristic not only for micro droplets, but also for quanta of new solar radiation, 1, 4, 5. Maxwell's field is carried by massless photons and is long range. The dipole nature of the magnetic field of micro drops was postulated by us during the preparation phase of the experiment. The very success of the experiment in our setup confirms the validity of this approach. The same effects were observed in the work of Leonid Arotskev et al. All the experiments described above allow one to estimate the magnitude of the magnetic moment of the micro droplets. The first estimate follows from the ratio mu b kt, which provides magnetization. For a field B of 0.4 Tesla and T 300 Kelvin, we obtain mu is greater or equal to 10 to the power 3 mu B, where mu B is the Bohr's magneton. A more accurate assessment follows from another experimental fact. It was said above that magnetization of water occurred in the presence of scattered radiation from the sun. However, when water was extracted from a magnetic field, it could be completely discharged in 30 minutes by exposing it to weak laser radiation. Thus, the magnetic field locks the micro droplets accumulated in the water. As is known, the energy of interaction of a particle with a magnetic moment mu with a magnetic field B is equal to E equals mu B. Assuming the maximum value of E equals the quantum energy HV for the short wavelength part of solar radiation, A is 300 nanometers, we obtain the condition for the magnetic moment, which ensures the locking of the micro droplet in a magnetic field with an induction of 0.4 Tesla, mu is greater than HV over B. It follows from the above condition that mu is greater or equal to 10 to the power 5 mu B. This value actually coincides with the value of the intrinsic magneton of a massive photon with a mass of 5 electron volts. Such a coincidence cannot be accidental. It confirms our concept of the origin of micro droplets that leave marks on photographic film. It should be noted that the massive photons themselves are not capable of leaving traces on the photographic film because the cassette containing the film is completely impervious to solar radiation. The proximity of the magnetic moment of a heavy microdrop to a single new quantum should not come as a surprise. It is known that when nucleons are combined into an atomic nucleus, the magnetic moment of the nucleus in nuclear magnetons is close in order of magnitude to the magnetic moment of the nucleon since the magnetic moments of nucleons in the nucleus cancel each other out in pairs. A similar process takes place in the formation of clusters from new quanta. Conclusion. Let's summarize some of the results. First of all, it is necessary to note full identity of traces on a photographic film in our experiments and in experiments with electro-explosive conductors in water by Leonid Aretzkev et al., and in high current arc discharges in atmosphere. So that's basically, you have a dielectric, which is the air, and you have a high current arc discharge. That is called a spark gap. The sensitivity of radiation, leaving traces on photographic film to an external magnetic field, also coincides with the ability of radiation to magnetize non-magnetic media, 
This is observed by John Hutchison. Non-magnetic materials became magnetic, i.e. accumulate in condensed media and be spontaneously re-emitted. Similar effects were observed in different years and under different experimental conditions and many other researchers. All this means that the radiation we register is real and identical to the observations of other researchers. It is also obvious that the recorded radiation differs sharply in its manifestations from the radiation, fields and particles known to date. Radiation is detected under significantly different experimental conditions. It is sufficient to compare the conditions of our experiments in which practically no energy sources are required in the laboratory to produce radiation and the conditions of experiments with a huge energy deposit into the pulse discharge 239. A common thing for the mentioned experiments is only the presence of a magnetic field. The reality of the new radiation also means that a new field and quanta of a new field are real. Moreover, the quanta have rest mass and are capable of forming macro objects larger than 10 millimeters in size. We can assume that a new state of matter is observed, which differs from the known states, including plasma. A feature of the new state of matter is the stability of the shape of the field macro objects and the great variety of shapes. The stability of the form is provided by the nonlinearity of the field and the ability of the field to form a minimum of the potential at a non-zero value of the field. An example of such a field is the scalar Higgs vacuum field. The new field, apparently, is the basis, a kind of skeleton of long-lived plasma formations, and natural ball lightning is related to them. The same forms were observed by us. It can also be assumed that the field structure with magnetic interaction, examples of which we considered above, are capable of fixing ions and electrons on the skeleton through the spin interaction and thereby delaying their decay plasma. Prolonged plasma glow under such conditions is possibly provided by the conversion of the accumulated energy of micro droplets of condensate. The radiation from magnetized water, as well as strange radiation from Leonid Oroitskerv, and radiation from other discharges and water electrolysis, can transform atomic nuclei which is confirmed by the mass spectrometric analysis of the mushroom flat, figures 7 and 8. The appearance of chemical elements that are not present in the light area of the photographic film, i.e. cold transmutation of chemical element nuclei, has been detected. So I give the references in Russian, and I have them also here in English for your ease. Now, what I've shown you by referencing all of these different methods that can create this kind of radiation, and by showing you that it was observed in the Lion reactor and that it was observed in the echo fuel that was looked at here, and it was observed in a Mars of vibrated water. A Mars of vibrated water is used to produce suitable water for fish and for eels. And I saw them in his lab, and it is claimed that they grow faster and bigger in this treated water. Now, in the case of Shishkin, he has this hydrodynamic generator, and he taps some of this water, and it seems to make plants grow very, very well. And when I was at the Sochi conference, one of the lecturers there, and I think I've included this presentation in the MFMP's YouTube channel, they were working with this company in Germany that was using a corona discharge, which we know corona streamer discharges produces this type of radiation. They were corona streamer discharging into water, and then they were applying this water to seeds and whilst the plant is growing. 
and the seeds were more disease resistant and they grew faster and stronger. And so you have a situation where it would seem that biology is using this. And that there are also other cases where some structured water, because this is definitely, as you can see, it is creating structures in the water and that they ostensibly hold immense amounts of energy in this field form. And this seems to be very, very important to life. And so <laughs> when, I, when I'm saying is this the elixir vitae, uh, you know, I, I've got in my mind this French scientist that went to Mexico and they had these pans and in, in the sunshine and then they, I think they had silver in there and a little dust of gold and then they would take that silver away and, and transmute it into gold and this is so the story goes. But it doesn't sound so silly now that, that maybe that intense sunlight was imbuing the water with this type of field form of energy that's capsulated into what they call as droplets or charge clusters in the terms of uh, Ken Shoulders. And then this primed that material for easy transmutation if the subsequent con conditions were right. And so really, y you have something that is able to impart life and health and exuberance to organic organisms, but also uh, that is able to transmute matter. And so really it does kind of fit the bill for Elixir Vitae. And so I just want to end by saying something about Ken Shoulders here. And, and this is on Rex Research, but actually he's referring to something at the end of Ken Shoulders' 1980s book, Evie, A Tale of Discovery, which was kind of like where he was in the early uh, to mid 80s, having explored the work of John Hutchison. And he says, Ken Shoulders also has suggested that the EV is a spherical monopole oscillator, as he describes it in the conclusion of his book, EV, A Tale of Discovery. This monopole oscillator is the perfect generator for vector and scalar potential waves without contamination from either electrical or magnetic fields. These waves can be thought of as longitudinal waves in the vacuum. They are largely undetectable by standard electric and magnetic detecting means, but are readily accessible to the monopole world. There appears to be an incredibly large number of useful phenomena yet to arise from using potential effects that are not immediately accessible to the force of E and B fields. This phase determined force-free world will certainly be another chapter somewhere in the future of EV research and development. And it goes on to talk about instantaneous transmutation, transmutation of material. Ken Shoulders has demonstrated the complete elimination of radioactivity in high-level nuclear material. Whatever the mechanism may be, the neutralization of our huge stores of radioactive waste by EV technology will be a great wonderment and blessing for which we can thank Ken Shoulders. And I would extend that to thanking John Hutchison, because if John Hutchison had not done what he did out of curiosity, there would have been no Ken Shoulders looking at this space. So there we have it. This took quite some time to translate and if you like the work that I'm doing and you think it has value, uh, please consider donating to the project. You can see some links for ways to do that in the description of the video. As usual, all of the references will be in the description of the video. I just want to put a warning in here uh, before everyone jumps off and starts producing this thing in this extremely easy way and consuming it you have to bear in mind that the damage that can be caused to biological systems by these things exploding within that biological system uh, can be extraordinary. And this was characterized by the presentation at Sochi in 2018 by Alexander Shishkin. Now, ordinarily you would imagine that it shouldn't fall apart inside the body. However, 1.5 milliwatt laser was able to pretty much within 30 minutes cause the removal or the ejection of all of the accumulated charge in the magnetized water in the test that I have described here. Now, whilst that is not necessarily causing them to explosively unpack, when they interacted with the film, they 
recorded their explosive unpacking. And so you have, in the case of one of these little micro droplets, 300 mega electron volts of power. And this, because it acts as a, as a massive boson, potentially like a vector boson, you have a situation where uh, it can cause instantaneous remediation of nuclear waste, but by the same token, it can cause instantaneous decay of potassium-40 and carbon-14. Potassium-40 being in uh, all through your body and carbon-14 uh, being in the sugar molecules that hold your DNA strands together. The real risk is that whilst the ancient people could have probably got away with using this technology, we unfortunately live in a world in a sea of electromagnetic radiation which could cause this type of condensed energy to decay very readily. So I think I would call for an international study into first producing this radiation and then seeing which electromagnetic frequencies cause it to decay. And so they used a, a laser pointed at the dish you could literally just hold your phone up and see if the, the Wi-Fi radiation coming from your phone is sufficient to cause the decay of these condensed forms of energy. If that is the case, this would account for cases of cancer and potentially cases of loss of sperm count and potentially all kinds of problems going on in biology throughout the biosphere. And this, for me, is one shocking realisation that I've come to, that we may be living in a world which we don't even, or the, the bulk of humanity out there, does not even have a concept of something that is able to be affected so greatly by the sea of electromagnetic energy we are currently subjected to. So I think now that I have seen this Russian work, and translated it and made it available to the wider scientific community, I think there's a deep responsibility for the world um, to take this seriously and to, and to explore it to the fullest depth possible um, because it has the potential to bring huge, huge benefit but also to explain rises of cancer in the world and other biological problems that are seem to be occurring. And I think this is a far, far more serious concern than some of the things that are discussed as being something scientifically we should be concerned about. So thank you very much for your time and uh, I will see you in the next video.